Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to PH Intimacy and Self Image. We are so glad to have you join us. I'm Jill Zajak, PHA's Patient Educator Program Manager, and I'll be hosting your event today. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, I, Iwana R. Preston. She is a critical care physician specializing in pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary medicine. She is the director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Center at Tufts Medical Center, director of the Pulmonary Function Lab and assistant professor of medicine. Without further ado, I introduce to you uh, Dr. Preston. Thank you, Jill, and thank PHA to coming back with a live seminar. It's so exciting that we can finally start going back to connecting with each other. What are our objectives for today? Um, let's describe a little bit how pH can affect uh, aspects of our intimate and personal life and understand what's the connection between physical, emotional, and interpersonal changes uh, when we have pH. Understand how is our self-image impacted if we have pH um, and how can we improve that and how can we feel better about ourselves and, you know, touch upon challenges of intimacy um, uh, about us and about our uh, most important and, and intimate issues. And let's see how can we improve to communicate our sexual needs um, with our partners um, and various options of physical and emotional intimacy. And I have to say all these aspects of our everyday life, it's not an issue or a problem or an important aspect for pH patients only. Think about it. This is an aspect of life itself. Otherwise, Dr. Ruth would not have made a lot of money about it, right? So let's see um, how we can uh, think about, um, you know, the aspects of our body um, that pH can affect uh, us. So it can affect us in um, physically, emotionally. Um, it can affect us of how we connect with our friends and partners. So interrelation um, connections, how can we work and how can we function in society. Um, some days are better than others. And some days when we don't feel well, we can feel loss of ability to stay fit, to keep up with previous uh, regimens, to not have enough strength and stamina. But, you know, sometimes we have uh, shortness of breath and problems with minimal exertion. Um, so we have to learn how to adjust day by day um, and how to preserve our energy um, in a day that um, is more difficult for us and go more active and enjoy life on a good day. We also have to understand when and if we require more assistance um, or need to, uh, you know, for, for help from other uh, uh, family or friends. Now, Talking about sex and what can affect sex uh, besides our mind and our body, some drugs can affect, uh, you know, our sexual performance. This is a very funny cartoon, you know. Why are there never any good side effects? Why can't I take a pill that says side effect may cause extreme sexiness? So then going back to our better halves, uh, our male partners or male, you know, uh, gentlemen who do have the happy blue pill, I should say, right? Um, that uh, was discovered because it had a great side effect. Um, and it turns out that it works very well in pulmonary hypertension. So um, I wonder why we women are so much more complex and complicated and cannot, you know, uh, get as much benefit um, in the intimacy and sexual life from the blue pill like our, uh, you know, gentlemen partners um, uh, can benefit from. Anyway, this is a list of medications that can affect negatively our sexual function. 
Um, many of them are not associated with pH, but if we have other comorbidities or, or we need other you know, help from other medications, this is a long list, to be honest with you. But if you talk to sex therapists, they say that the majority of sexual dysfunction is mental, not necessarily. There may be a component of medications, but not most of the time it's not medications that causes problems. So changes in functionality and independence. Functionality meaning, you know, can be affected depending on what you do, what your job is. Do you have to give up your job? Do you have to change uh, the way you perform your job? Or do you have to apply for disability because, you know, uh, you feel more short of breath? as well as independence. Um, do you need some help from other people? Now, I have to tell you, you know, Jill and I were going through the slides and we were looking, the first few slides, they may seem re really like a downer, but actually um, it's a red dot and it's, it's an eye opening to first and foremost recognize what our limitations are in order to make things better. So, of course, if you feel if you feel that you cannot perform physically, you, the, your emotions may be affected. You may feel down, and sometimes on the intellectual level, you may not be as sharp. For example, if you don't have a good night's sleep, the next day you feel terrible. You cannot concentrate. Sometimes you cannot even drive. Right. So it's an everyday life that we have to deal with. And at the sexual level and at the intimacy level, interpersonal level, uh, sometimes uh, we become disconnected with our loved ones and with our partners because of the issues that I mentioned about. about. And sometimes we feel less desirable. Sometimes we don't feel sexy. Uh, we feel down and you know, we, we look down on ourselves. And this is where we can intervene. And we, first of all, I think we need to make sure that we love ourselves. Our body image is basically what we think our people think about us or us, how do we look in other people's eyes? It's not our self image it's our mirror towards other people so because of that the way you project you project confidence and love and beauty inner beauty first of all by loving yourself as an inner person so you know we are all women are different shapes and different sizes and um, this is how we were born it's not a whole lot that you can change about. Um, so why focus on something that you cannot change? Focus on something that you can change. Love yourself. Look at yourself in a positive way. And if you do that, other people will do. Because our bodies communicate. There is a body language that speaks without words and tells other people that you do love yourself, you are important for yourself. And, and that's, that's a very positive Im, uh, message towards your loved ones, your friends, your family, and other people who do not know you. So the first step to connect or reconnect with your loved one um, or connect with a new love is to give yourself some me time. I know you guys and we all women do take care of others. Uh, family, kids, uh, I don't know, friends. Uh, our everyday life is full of caring for others constantly, constantly, constantly. Take time every day, at least 10 minutes and that will be me time. And this is a list of what you want to do. And you should choose what you really like to do. If you don't like to meditate, don't. Um, if you want to talk to your best friend, just talk to her or him. 
even if it's a Zoom or a FaceTime, it's very important. If you wanna clean or cook or bake, do it. Um, I have a very good friend when we were in training, um, we were both residents and of course sleep deprived for years and she loved herself and she would go home and take a nap because that was her me time to catch up with sleep. And she would sleep for a cat nap, a power nap, 15, 20 minutes. Even when her house was in complete construction and her husband with construction workers were doing the walls and everything and there was only a couch that was free in the middle of the living room, she would take a pillow and, and, and crash on the, on, the, uh, on the couch and that was her me time and she did not care for 15 minutes about anybody else but her. This is what we need to do. All right, so from intimacy to, to you know, going to really, 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 really intimate relationships and, and, and sex, um, you know, if you can carry groceries, do shopping, cook, make your bed, and do everyday activities in the house and outside the house, you can, you can handle sex. That is my prescription. Um, and sex is not only sex for us women. It is a lot of intimacy that includes sex. Um, so don't think about being depressed. Don't think about uh, you know, being down. And again, there are good days and bad days. Uh, because we are social creatures and touching and cuddling and connecting physically with somebody in your life is very important. Um, you know, somebody told me that uh, sex is like a bona fide exercise. You can reduce it to that point. And it is bona fide because it releases a lot of endorphins, even by touching and by physical connection not only by climax, but it, is, um, it, it, it makes you feel good by connecting with someone. Um, and for those folks, um, when we don't have a partner, and sometimes in our lifetime, right, we don't always have a partner. Um, it's nothing wrong to love yourself in a physical way. So here we go. Although physical demands of sexual activity can be high, they're not always high. Uh, really, really few chronic illnesses restrict sexual activity. Um, so the connection with your partner, if you have a partner, has to be not only him taking care of you, him being your caregiver. Yes, he can spoil you. Yes, he can do things for you, but you should be in charge of you and your body and yourself and project to him that he's not only there to take care of you, but he's your really soul partner and physical partner. Um, all right, so how can we make it work? Um, of course, communication, which sometimes is not easy because we all know that uh, you know our lovely partners, if we have them, are sometimes hard to communicate and men are harder to open up, right? We are always chatty and we are always happier to you know to discuss and to you know uh, um, find details and whatnot. Um, but you know, connecting on an emotional level, on a touching and and feeling level. And then ultimately on a sexual level. And you know, if you think about, now I know this is a recorded seminar, it, but now lively, it's only us ladies that we talk. So, you know, if later um, the, 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 the male, the guys will listen to what I'm saying, it's fine. Now I can be open uh, because they're not listening. So, you know, find good positions that make you less short of breath. And, and, you know, sometimes not both partners can achieve climax. And, you know, one time it's you, one time is your partner, but it's the intimacy and the touching and the being close physically that I think it's very important. 
um, it's only natural. So check with your partner, find, you know, a better day for you, uh, give him signals, um, you know, um, pay attention to your body when you, when you're having sex. Uh, it's like when you exercise, if you can't do it, if you have to slow down, you have to slow down. Your body will give you signals how much you can and how much you cannot. Uh, one of my younger patients, I had just put her, her on, on um, infusion. Of course, it was a shock for her to have a new diagnosis. And this was the first, first time that we diagnosed her. So she went directly on an infusion because her pH was very severe. And after six weeks, you know, she improved enough. And then I sat down with her and her partner and I said, now you can have sex. You cannot get pregnant, please, but you can have sex. So of course the guy was so happy. I cannot tell you. And she was still, and she was still, um, I think to give the green card to, to the couples or to, you, you know, your, your patients as a caregiver and touch upon this, uh, this aspect of life is very important. Don't be afraid to exercise. Don't be afraid to have sex. Don't be afraid to be intimate because your body will signal you when you have to slow down. You know about your disease and your body more than you think. So, you know, a few tips, create a sensual environment, um, you know, more romantic, mood light, music, location, candles, whatever you think it works for you and your partner. Um, choose the positions that are best for you. And again, don't do very hard work if you can't. Uh, do as much as you can. Uh, these are some, some uh, you know, suggested positions. Um, and I really uh, um, uh, encourage you, Jill will tell you a little bit about our brochure that has more tips uh, at, at a detail level. Lubricants, absolutely important, especially ladies who are around menopause or postmenopausal um, or have Sjogren's or connective tissue disease, which is associated with a little bit of dry mouth, dry mucosa, uh, uh, dry vaginal mucosa. It's very important to use these things. Personal toys are fine as long as they don't hurt you. Um, and again, touching skin to skin, like when you are a mom and you have your baby and everybody says, oh, you have to be skin to skin to connect with a baby. The same thing with your other baby, the partner. All right, so if you have questions, go to your, to your uh, provider. Uh, we probably know more than we communicate we know about these issues. And if your doctor is a male, tell him, you know what, I wanna talk to your nurse about lady issues or to your nurse practitioner or to your pharmacist or whoever is a female in their group. And they won't mind. Actually, they will be like, oh, that's a great idea, you know? And if you are connected uh, with your family, you can talk to your family. They may have some tips. They may have some providers that know um, that, that can, can give you some help um, in certain aspects. So primary care provider, I would say the pH provider knows a little bit more about your limit, physical limitations um, than the primary care. Although, you know, the OBG and primary care would have valuable information, not only about how not to get pregnant, but how to deal with vaginal dryness and, and other issues. And you are in charge, it's your decision. You will connect with them. You know, we are pulmonologists and cardiologists and a lot of the times we do not think about this aspect of life, which is very important. And we are not proactive as, at approaching you as a patient to discuss these intimate issues. So don't be shy, come to us. All right, so in summary, Although we all recognize that having pH 
can affect your physical activity and your physical demands. Um, we can adjust, we can move forward and try to adjust and understand our body. And again, sex is not a contraindication. It's how you do it to make you feel better, to connect with your partner and, you know, in a safe way, like an exercise. So don't be shy. Think about it, approach your partner and, and try it slowly if you haven't done it in a while, but it's worth going back to it. And uh, with this, I will give over uh, the control to Jill, who will take it from here. Hello again, everybody. So we wanted to um, thank you so much, Dr. Preston. It's been very informative. Um, before we do jump into our questions and move along, we wanted to let you know that PHA has an intimacy guide. It was produced, I believe, in 2019. It's Living with PH, a guide to intimacy. And it does have an over 18 without parental approval uh, box that you need to click off before you print it or pull it up on a PDF form. But it is available online for free. It has a lot of those um, talks about a lot of different topics that you know Dr. Preston went over, um, including different positions and, and different concerns that you might want to read about at home or you know bring home and have available to refer to. So you can find that at phaassociation.org backslash a guide to intimacy. We also have other free materials in our store. We have a living with series that you can also access. So please feel free to do so. So now is the time when we are going to get to our Q&A, our questions. The first question that I have for you, uh, Dr. Preston, is a question about intimacy. It says, I'm a 57 year old and sex is already a little challenging for me and my partner because of menopause. I have just started using oxygen 24 seven. We haven't even tried to have sex since. It seems so awkward and unromantic with a cannula and the tangle of the tubes. I'm wondering whether other people feel this awkward and what we can do about it. Mm. Yeah, those are very good questions because you know lines and tubes and 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 oxygen um, may may feel like it looks awkward, um, and it all depends on you know on your partner too. Um, you know, if you have a condition, it may push your partner. Uh, apart from you, it may make him more distant, but he may be afraid because he would love to stay close to you, but he doesn't know how would you react. So your fear may be mirror exactly his fear of him hurting you. If you're open and say, come on, let's try, what the heck, I'll get some lubricant. And you know, if we can do it, we can do it. And if we can't, we'll try it another time. Um, they, I, I, because men are, 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 are afraid of, of hurting, uh, you know, their women. Um, so I think you have to give him the free passage. So you not be afraid will project to him that he's okay to try. And it's okay to try again slowly, step by step, and you know, perimenopause, definitely I would use lubricant. Um, KY is a good one and a cheap one. Um, there's another brand that's called Pure Romance that uh, it's more expensive. They say it's better. Um, I don't know. I guess there are no comparative trials. <laughs> I think whatever works for you. Um, but definitely use lubricant if you're peri perimenopausal and you haven't had sex in a while. That will help a lot. Great. So Dr. Preston, can you um, expand upon that a little bit? There's another question or comment that I received. And, you know, there's a variety of different relationships that people are in these days, whether they're married or obviously being at home through COVID, people are at home um, doing different things online and such. Um, but the person remarked that they're, they said that my husband says he's afraid of hurting me. What can I do? And I know you just spoke a little about that. Would you mind for anyone else in other relationships as well, how to... Yeah. Communicate, yeah. I guess, better and, and explore that. Yeah, I think showing him that you're not afraid will help him be a little more courageous to going back 
to being intimate. Um, I was at a uh, intimacy seminar um, a few years back when we used to have it in person, and I was lucky to be one of the chairs. Um, and one of the patients uh, who was, I think she was like early 50s, her kids were early 20s, she was on Flowland and Oxygen. And she was telling us stories how she would have sex with her husband in the basement so the, so the kids won't find them. And they were very creative. They got a pole and then they were hanging the Flowland pump up so it's, it's uh, you know, away from the body and doesn't pull. And then the oxygen, they figured it out. But I think the first important steps is you go to him and say, honey, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm not afraid, even if you are a little bit afraid, because together will be easier to make things happen again. Wonderful. I have another question to follow that up. A question from the attendee is, is it okay to remove oxygen just briefly when kissing? Mm. Um, well, it depends. And some people, absolutely, because kissing, you know, it's not a whole lot of activity. When do you use oxygen? Mostly when you, when you, you, you need to move around. Definitely if you're on oxygen for exertion and at night, yeah, you have moments when, when your oxygen is out. Now, if you're on five, six liters of oxygen, that may, may be a little harder, um, but you can try, you can try. A, a, a very safe way to do it is when you see your physician, ask them, to check your oxygen level off oxygen. And if it's not very low, if it's 90%, you know, I think it's fine. But that would be a, a safe way to go. Okay. I have another question that uh, was sent in previous to this webinar. It says, I'm, I'm on Romangelin. Does this medication affect my eggs? I asked because I'm 38. I was diagnosed with PAH at 36. I like to harvest my eggs since I'm unable to carry them. Um, and the person, you know, gave information that it's something they're only willing to do once and with one of their sisters. And they wanted to see if, does remodulin affect their eggs? And, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so that's a very complex situation because it has different levels that need to be addressed. So first of all, we treat pregnant women with infusion prostacyclines if they come to us pregnant and they have bad pH. Uh, sometimes only during the pregnancy and after their birth for a few months, uh, sometimes they stay on, a, uh, on, the, uh, on the prostacycline replacement therapy such as Flolan, Valetri, or Remodulin. Um, there, of course, there are no studies, but prostacyclines are naturally occurring molecules in the body that people with pH do not produce as much. And there are no information, there's no information that it can affect the eggs negatively. Now, if you want to become pregnant and you have pH, my recommendation is to, to go to a pH center to test to see if there's any possibility that your PAH is familial because that may imply that you may transmit the disease, may or may not, to your offsprings. So because this is such a complex matter, my recommendation is if you go to a PAH center to have genetic counseling to decide whether you need and you want to be tested for familiar mutations that cause PAH in order to see what are the risks of you know, giving the mutation to the, to the egg. Once this is established, yes, you can, you can donate eggs to a surrogate mothers to carry a, a pregnancy. For that, you have to get IVF, so in, in vitro fertilization. So they have to stimulate your ovaries to make a lot of eggs. So when they retrieve, they have a good chance of getting enough eggs that are fertile. During the IVF, 
there are some side effects. Some of the side effects cause fluid retention and sometimes really ascites in very rare cases without pH. So it can be done, um, but it has to be done at a specialized center and very cautiously with maybe starting the lowest doses of, of hormones for induction of fertilization and, and, and followed by a pH physician along the process. Thank you for a very thorough answer. I'm sure you appreciate it. Um, I have a question for you that came in and basically they asked, what's the difference between pH and PAH and the different treatments that will affect, you know, your sex life? Mm. Well, so PAH is that group one that affects the small vessels in the lungs for which we have all the therapies that I'm sure you're all aware from pills to inhaled to subcutaneous to infusions. The rest that's not in that group is called pH, and it's caused by advanced lung disease such as COPD or emphysema, or advanced heart disease such as uh, heart failure on the left side. Uh, for those conditions, we don't have a specific medication for the pH, although there are some subgroups that now we start having. Uh, so uh, things may be changing in the next years. Um, we don't think that the drugs that we treat PAH with affect sexual function. Um, on the contrary, most of them are vasodilators that are not vasodilators in the lungs, but they vasodilate, they open up the blood vessels in other parts of the body. For example, your MPD-5 inhibitors, it gives you a headache, and that's because there's more blood going into the brain. Um, your own prostacyclines, you're flushed, that's because there's more blood in the face. So everything that opens up the blood vessels and irrigates and, 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 and brings blood to organs, including the genital organs, actually may enhance your sexual desire, if you would, or performance. Okay, I have a previous question that kind of ties into that, uh, that was submitted previous to the webinar. Ever since I've been taking medication for my pH, I've been experiencing side effects that affect my sex life, including dryness and lack of libido. Do you have any recommendations? Hmm, yeah. So, it's interesting. Um, I would start responding with a question. Are you sure is it drugs or is it the fact that you are diagnosed with an illness and it's your body and your mind trying to adjust and adapt uh, to the diagnosis rather than the drugs? Now, I, I'm not aware that these drugs, again, cause some side effects that decrease the sexuality. The dryness um, may be part of, if you have connective tissue disease, such as scleroderma or Sjogren's uh, or a mixed connective tissue disease. Um, and it may affect how the vaginal mucosa is, is, if it's moist or not. The other thing is we know even idiopathic pH or pH, you know, that's not affect, uh, connected with connective tissue diseases has an autoimmune flavor um, with some autoantibodies and some, you know, inflammatory uh, molecules that may themselves cause some dryness in the skin, like the connective tissue diseases, uh, even though you don't have this label. Um, so it may be part of your pH that makes you dry. The libido, I think most of the libido, I mean, if you're young, that's probably because you're emotionally affected by the, by the disease and your libido will get better once your self-esteem and your, your self-love comes back. If you're perimenopausal and postmenopausal, our libidos go down. I mean, there's no, that's, that's physiological. We don't have as much 
sex hormones in our body, so our libidos go down. Um, and it is what it is. But, you know, the li libido can be, uh, you know, adjusted to your needs, but also we do have to take into account our partner's needs too. So we have to put them together because you're in a relationship. Use lubricant. I love your tips, they're very good. So we have another question. Can you give any tips for listening to your body and knowing your perceived exertion versus getting too excited in the moment? What's the best way to stay safe without getting too caught up in the moment? Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good question. So your body will tell you when you have to slow down. Let's say you try to exercise, you go out and try to, you know, walk two blocks. When do you stop? When is it safe? When is it safe to continue? And when do you stop? You will know when you need to stop. You will know when you need to slow down when you walk. It's the same thing is with sex. You will know when you slow when you need to slow down. Um, another way to test yourself is, and I know we recorded, but hey, we're talking about intimacy and sex. Have sex with yourself and see how much you can endure. It's the safest way, right? Perfect. So on that note, um, the question, next question is, what if you're single and you want to date? I feel it's not an option given my prognosis. How does someone address this? That is another very good question. You're young um, or not anymore, uh, but you don't have a partner. How can you connect with a new partner when you have a condition? any condition, right? And remember, nobody's perfect. Nobody's completely healthy, whether we have mental issues or joint issues or family issues that we cannot go and get over because of our you know, stress and trauma in childhood. Nobody's perfect. You can connect and you know, I'm hopelessly romantic I think everybody has a soulmate out there. So, you know, whether you want to tell, you know, your new date from the beginning or not, it's your choice and no one can force you to be completely open in the beginning if you start a relationship. And, you know, nowadays we're all locked up with COVID. So, you know, new relationships must, be harder than ever but think about it the new partnerships have been increasingly uh happening because of the internet and now we're connected to the internet so maybe that's one way to do it and maybe connecting on the internet longer before you meet maybe safer more interesting more exciting because you can't wait to meet the guy you're talking with for months and months because of COVID, you know? Lots of uh, different obstacles in addition to having a chronic disease diagnosis in this, this time frame. Uh, another question that I have is, says, hello, I'm 27, still not on oxygen yet, but I always think that if, I'm ox if I am on oxygen, I will feel less sexy. How should I think about this? I say, don't think about it. Just go enjoy life, enjoy good days, date, and take it one day at a time. Have a positive attitude. Some people don't go on oxygen forever. I mean, there's not a guarantee that you will need oxygen. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, no. And while we're at it, could you explain then some of the, I know we had some of the, in the intimacy guide, we show some of the bubble figures and different positions that people can utilize in their relationships. Are there positions that, you know, require less exertion? Or I know you mentioned somebody mm -hmm. put their, their tubing up on a pole. What are some mm -hmm. things that you can recommend for people um, that are mm -hmm. on oxygen? Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> if, for example, think about it. If your partner is light, then the regular position uh, with him on top of you 
may be fine because he's going to do more of the work. But if he's a heavy guy, then it may put a strain on your chest and you may not be able to breathe. So having sex on the side uh, in the spoon position may be better for you. The other thing is you have to have, you have to know the positions that you feel the best and you get the best feel during sex, you know? So it's, it's a trade-off, right? So it's a trial and error. That's what I'm saying. And if you feel short of breath and you really need to stop, you know, he will understand because again, men do not want to hurt their women. So they'll be okay. Um, and then you can change positions, catch your breath, change positions, you know, or just cuddle and say, let's try again tomorrow or, you know, in the next day or so. Perfect. I have more questions rolling in. Uh, the question is, I have, scl I have scleroderma and PAH and I am very dry and I've tried lubrications and they burn. Is there a lubrication that doesn't burn in the private area? Mm. Not that I know. I don't know what you've tried um, out there. Um, there. There are a couple of options. I would ask the, the OBGYN and also look at the lubricants that do not have alcohol because usually if they have a alcohol um, in, the, in the mix, uh, that may be the burning sensation. The other ones are those without flavor um, or perfume because perfume has an alcohol base. So with, it's like, you know, when you choose your shampoo and you have, you know, perfect, you know, flavor free and perfume free and paraben free and da, 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 da. So there are, I think there are some lubricants that are alcohol free, make sure they don't have perfume and alcohol. Okay. The next question is, is sex okay if someone is on immunosuppressants? Absolutely. Go for it. Perfect. Uh, the other question is, are there some kinds of birth control that are better than others to use for people with pH? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, and a very important one because you're on birth control, you have a partner, you can go for it, right? Um, for my young patients, I use intrauterine devices. Um, they have a little coating of estrogen, but it's very minimal and they've been very safe and very effective at preventing uh, pregnancies. And they're easy to use. You put the device um, and every five years you change it. So you really don't have a problem. The pills have more estrogen, um, and we don't know if that amount of estrogen may be detrimental to the pulmonary hypertension. So that's why we typically do not recommend pills. There are, there are forms of injectable and patches of progesterone only. That's another option if you don't tolerate the IUD device, the intrauterine device. But nowadays, the intrauterine devices are very small and there are different sizes. So even if you're petite, um, your GYN can find, you know, a smaller size and you can ask them, um, you know, I'm, I'm small, give me the smallest that you have. Um, because if they're too big, they can give you some back pain. That's what I've seen at my patients. But yeah, there, there, there are quite a few options of safe contraception and, and really effective. And then can you expand a little bit on the necessity to use multiple forms or if you are using certain lubricants with certain methods of protection that is yeah. extremely important to use a backup yeah. method? Yeah, that's a very important. So IUDs do not need a backup plan, a backup uh, contraception. But if your partner uses a condom, then the condoms are not 100% safe. So you need to use a gel. Uh, if you use a gel, they're not 100% safe, so you need to use a condom. So anything other than hormonal therapy or mechanical therapy, you need to have two methods of contraception. Perfect. 
So on another note, we did have on one of the slides, um, it says, how many spoons do you have left? So there was a question. I know we didn't get into it too much. Do you want to explain the, the spoon theory and people having spoons and how many spoons you use for energy and discuss that? <laughs> uh, yes, you know, it is, or, it's, or stars. I, I'll, I'll say stars yeah. because I like better than spoons. So, you know, it, one day you have five stars, you know, you're full of energy and you can push yourself and you can do more stuff. And sometimes the next day you're more tired because you did a lot and it's okay. And that day you have two stars or two spoons and that day you take it slowly and you do less. You don't have sex maybe, or you have only cuddling or you have sex, but you don't go shopping. It's your choice. What Perfect. do you think, Jill? What do you think about the spoon thingy thing? No, I, I agree with it. I, I think you're hundred percent correct there that I like stars instead of spoons because who needs spoons? <laughs> stars are much better. Exactly. I think, I think that explains a lot. Yeah. Cause I just, you know, just kind of ex expands on the fact that people only have a certain amount of energy or capacity in a day. And I think, you know, everyone, especially during, again, with COVID and being at home in winter, it's some days you have two stars and, you know, you, you, have to always check in with yourself and don't get pressured by those around your obligations to have sex or anything else you know check in with yourself first before yeah. using your star <laughs> exactly um, exactly how many stars do i have and those stars may mean mental strength and energy or physical strength and energy and that's a combination and you know Remember, you know your body best. Okay. I have another question that came in. It says, I would like to begin dating and try being intimate with my partners, but I prefer to be intimate with other women. Is there anything I need to keep in mind that's different uh, with a woman being intimate with a woman than a woman being intimate with a male with P well, having PH? No, not at all. Um, a lover is a lover is a lover whether it's the same sex or not. So, you know, the only good thing is you can't get pregnant, <laughs> but, uh, but, but really, it really doesn't matter who you love. Um, it, it, the, the, the same principles apply whether you love a woman or you, or you love a man, or today you love a man and tomorrow you love a woman. Perfect. I have an, one well, about two more questions and I'm going to start wrapping up for the evening. Um, uh, if anyone else has any other questions or anything else you want to talk about, Dr. Preston, please feel free to. Uh, I do have a question that says, how do you deal with fluctuations in weight due to fluid retention? Mm. Um, so think about it. Fluctuation in weight as fluid retention happens in all women, especially in the premenopausal women, you know, with the cycle with a menstrual cycle. You know, you feel bloated before you have your period, uh, and then, you know, you get rid of the, the fluid, then, you know, hot, humid, you know, summer day, you feel that you retained more fluid because the body feels the heat, so it holds on to the fluid, I think. Um, it seems, and it is more pronounced in people who have pulmonary hypertension. Um, Sometimes as a physician, I, if, if the patient knows their body and knows their medication, sometimes I'd let them tweak the water pills if they're on water pills. So for example, if you feel that, you know, the, for the past three days, you gained more weight and your legs are puffier, the next day, take double the dose or take a pill and a half of the, of the water pill. Depends on Depend. I mean, I cannot give you exact, uh, uh, you know, recommendations, but sometimes you let the patient adjust their water pills. But talk to your physician before you implement that plan to make sure he or she is on your backup plan should you need. Another possibility is if you're close to your nurse practitioner or physician in the pH group, it is to call them and say, ah. Oh, I gained five pounds, what the heck am I doing, you know? So you can adjust that. The other thing is you can adjust your diet. If you notice you've 
let's say it was Christmas and or or Thanksgiving, and you know we splurge in those days, right? Uh, around holidays, you had a little more salt. Of course, you had a little bit of drink, you know, the gravy and this and that, and you gained more weight. Um, the next week, try to limit your salt intake because that helps the water pill kick in and get rid of your fluid. Thank you for answering that. I'm gonna round out with one last question before I hand the floor to you. Are there are permanent methods of birth control, i.e. tying tubes, et cetera, recommended or safe for younger pH patients? Hmm. Um, yes, they are safe. Um, I mean, depends on how severe your pH is because tying tubes is a, is, a, is a procedure. So it's an invasive procedure. It's not surgery, right? It doesn't, you know, the surgeon doesn't open up the belly, but it entails a little bit of sedation. Um, you know, they have to go in. So um, it's a little bit more complicated than an IUD to place. Um, and if you and your physician decide that that's the best way, uh, the best method for you, then I suggest having the procedure done in a center with the accordance of your pH physician so they know exactly what the surgeons are doing um, and they are available and sometimes we have uh, you know, atropine at the bedside, uh, you know, in the OR, and we run fluids, and we kind of help the anesthesiologist make the procedure the safest way. So thank again, you. I do want to thank our expert speaker, Dr. Iwana Preston. Mm -hmm.